Tonight, live from the University of Delaware, Delaware Debates, featuring the candidates for the U.S. House of Representatives. Hello, everyone. On behalf of Delaware Public Media and the University of Delaware Center for Political Communication, welcome to Delaware Debates 2022. I'm Ralph Begleiter. Delaware Debates is supported by the University of Delaware's College of Arts and Sciences and the offices of the Provost and the President. This debate includes candidates in the race for Delaware's sole seat in the U.S. House of Representatives. The Democratic Party's nominee for Congress is Lisa Blunt Rochester, the incumbent. The Republican candidate for Congress is Lee Murphy. Welcome to you both. We're very glad to have your participation in the debates this year. Now, both candidates have agreed in advance to rules for this 90-minute debate. I'll begin with a question for each of them, and they've agreed to hold their answers to specific time limits. We'll also have some questions posed by a student, Meg Rossler, executive producer for Student Television Network at the University of Delaware. Although the candidates have agreed that there will be no opening statements, you will hear closing statements from both candidates later in the program. The candidates will answer in the order they themselves determined with a pre-debate coin toss. We'll try to keep our questions concise and ask the candidates to answer succinctly as well so we can cover as much ground together as possible. We'll focus first on the nation's economy, which is at the top of most voters' minds. My first question goes to Lisa Blunt Rochester. Congresswoman, you voted for something called the Inflation Reduction Act, which was the name Congress gave to a big bill, including a lot of Democratic priorities. Does the act actually reduce inflation? And what does it do to the national deficit? First of all, I want to thank the University of Delaware for having me, and thank you, Ralph, and thank you to Delaware for the opportunity to serve. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, which we passed, really, to me, is about Delaware families and the things that I've heard up and down this state. Um, everything from lowering our prescription drug prices for our seniors um, to making sure that our energy costs are lowered. And it is actually paid for by really taxing those businesses and those individuals that are at that top tier percent, some businesses that have never paid taxes. And so for us, the Inflation Reduction Act for the seniors, one of the things that it does is allow us to negotiate costs, prices through Medicare, for which we've never been able to do before. We can negotiate for planes through the Pentagon, but we can't negotiate for drug prices. It also caps at $2,000 um, the amount that a senior would pay for their prescription drugs. I literally had a tele town hall meeting where I had to repeat it three times because they could not believe that this was something that was possible. And also capping the price of insulin to $35. Again, it's paid for, but it also is meant to touch people's kitchen table issues energy, prescription drugs, making sure we invest in our climate as well. So that's really um, the first of its kind, a, a massive bill that we were able to pass that really will have an impact on families in Delaware. Now, a related question to you, Mr. Murphy. You have criticized the Biden, Biden administration for not doing enough to fight inflation. Many economists say that presidents actually have very few tools that they can use to fight the underlying course, causes and forces of inflation. But regardless of whether you agree that's true or not, please suggest three additional ways that you think a president could, could act to have a moderating effect on inflation over, let's say, the next 6 to 12 months. Well, Ralph, it's a pleasure to be here. And hi to the audience listening and watching this evening. You know, inflation, as I travel up and down the state of Delaware and talk to Delawareans, it's the number one concern of the people in this state. And we're facing the highest inflation in over 50 years in our country right now. Now, inflation, how do we curb it? How do we fix it? It's when supply, when demand outstrips supply. And let's face it, the government is spending money, printing money, trillions of dollars in unnecessary spending. We have to get the foot off the neck of our small businesses in this state. We have to let them do what they do best, and that is to create jobs. 
We have to get a red, rid of unnecessary regulations, lower taxes, make it easier for people to do business in this state. You know, it doesn't take a lot to get inflation under control. The government just has to use a little discipline in how they spend our money. And we can get this problem in a relatively short time under control. Now I'd like to ask a question of both of you. Uh, that is related to the inflation question you've both just addressed. Do you each support continuing the U.S. pressure on Russia to end its unprovoked war against Ukraine, even if it means continued economic hardship for Americans, including things like higher gas prices, higher grocery prices? Mr. Murphy, first shot. Let's talk about energy independence, ladies and gentlemen. This country just two years ago was energy independent. We used our natural resources in this country, our gas, our oil, our coal. What did this president do day one? Shut down the Keystone Pipeline, shut off leases in this country for oil and gas exploration. We need to put the people back to work on the Keystone Pipeline, open that pipeline, get that oil into our refineries and back into Americans' cars at $2 a gallon, which it was just two years ago. Our energy independence is so important, not only economically, but for our national defense. As we see overseas in Ukraine, the crisis that faces the people of Ukraine, how is Putin funding that war? He is funding that war by selling his oil to our friends in Europe and all over the world. We were just two years ago a net exporter of oil to our friends in Europe. The bottom line, that war right now financed by oil, Russian oil, would not be happening if the United States was energy independent and we could help our friends and cut off that supply of Russian oil. The question was about whether you would continue to support Ukraine even if it meant a continued stress on, on the inflation rate in the United States, on gas prices and other things. Would you vote to continue supporting Ukraine? Yes, I support the Ukraine. It's a humanitarian crisis, okay? And I just want to get back to the energy independence. And now we have the energy dependence. This war, first of all, would not be happening if we were energy independent. Russia would not have the finances to finance this war. So. Yes, the predicament we were in was, is a result of one decision made by this president, day one in office, to cut off our energy independence. This elections have consequences, and this is one of the tragic consequences that we face. Congresswoman Blunt Rochester, your response to the question of whether you would continue to support uh, fighting the, Ukraine fighting the war against Russia, even if it means stress on the inflation in the United States. Well, first of all, let's be clear. This war was because Putin, unprovoked, was the aggressor to the Ukraine, to, uh, to the Ukrainian people. I mean, let's be clear about that. This was not a Joe Biden war. This was a Putin war. Secondly, to your question, what is disappointing about the answer is that in my time in Congress, this has been a bipartisan issue. This hasn't been something we've you know, politicize. It has been a bipartisan issue because there are consequences to what Putin is doing. There are global consequences. There are consequences to democracy. There are consequences to our safety and security. And so to your question, you know, I think this is one of the reasons why we run. The American people have stood up and said that this is a tough time. We understand that inflation is a challenge. As a matter of fact, I actually went and put forth supply chain uh, provisions to make sure that people understood why it's difficult to get some of the products that we've gotten. We were in a pandemic. This is a pandemic, once in a lifetime. And so we are feeling a different effect. Again, to me, our support for Ukraine has been strong. It has been bipartisan, and I hope it continues to be bipartisan. I'd it's like about to, democracies around the world as well. I, I, you had a follow-up uh, answer to your to the first question. I'm going to move on, but can sticking I get a follow-up then to supply chain. To supply chain. 
the, Go for it. Yes, uh, and, I, and I'm glad that Mr. Murphy brought up supply chains because one of the things I've had a chance to do is actually go around the state and talk to business owners, talk to uh, individuals, and it started with the pandemic. When being on the health subcommittee in Congress, I was able to see that we were not able to get PPE, we were not able to get vials, things were made in other parts of the world. And so what we did was we focused on how can we bring our supply chains back home? How can we make things in America? And so I authored provisions that are in legislation and now we are able to see, even with the Chips and Science Bill, that we're bringing those jobs back home. We're making sure that we're strong. Even our car dealerships. I went to a car dealership, they had no cars. I went to a company here that makes mammogram machines. They didn't have the chips. That's the kind of work that you have to do to solve difficult problems in Congress, and I'm glad that I've been able to work on that. Sticking with the national economy and an issue both of you would have to vote on as a member of Congress if, if you're elected to Congress this time, the national debt has ballooned over the last two presidential administrations, caused by several things, including huge tax cuts and huge stimulus spending during the pandemic. After voting to spend money, Congress routinely engages in political brinksmanship about raising the debt ceiling, and then usually raise, always raises the debt ceiling anyway. My question to you is, should Congress stop pretending there is a debt limit? Congresswoman Blunt Rochester, you take that one first. No, I don't think we should stop. I, I think, I think it is important for us to be fiscally responsible. That's why I even shared with the last bill in terms of the Inflation Reduction Act, looking for ways to pay for that, as opposed to the Trump tax cuts, that there was no way to pay for that. I do think we have to be responsible, and I do think it's something that we need to do together. Again, I come from a background of governing. I come from a background of bringing people together. And so for me, it's important that we sit down together and talk about how do we deal with these issues that sometimes seem simple, but they're not. They're more comp complex. And so, um, no, I think we, we must be responsible, and, and that's important to me as well. Mr. Murphy, on the debt limit, uh, would you support uh essentially stopping to prevent, to pretend that there is a debt limit, just keep approving it? Yes, as your congressman, one, one duty that I have is your checkbook. I have to have, I have to be able to justify what Congress spends. It's your tax dollars. And quite frankly, this current Congress has spent trillions and trillions of dollars in wasteful spending, in programs that really have no end. And that the accountability of Congress, where's the accountability? We need to account for every single dollar of taxpayers' money. And the debt is out of control, $31 trillion and growing. This is unsustainable. We cannot continue to print money. We cannot continue to spend trillions and trillions of dollars in government programs. We have to rein in spending. We have to incentivize business. How do we get back to 0.0 .0 inflation? How do we get back to a vibrant economy? Let's get the foot of government off the neck of small businesses, manufacturing, create jobs, people pay taxes, the debt goes down, and we have, once again, a healthy economy. That's the way I see getting us back on track in this country economically. So if you're elected to Congress, would you vote to raise the debt, debt limit or not, or would you vote against raising the debt limit? I would vote to get our spending under control, to again incentivize small business, small man, manufacturing, bring jobs back to the United States. We talk about the supply chain crisis. Well, this administration created this supply chain crisis. We need to once again make things in the United States. And why has it taken the Congresswoman six years to address this issue? We need to make things in this country, our life-saving pharmaceuticals, computer chips. We need to once again make things in the United States so we don't have these supply chain issues that this administration has given us. All right, your next so, question for both of you uh, comes from UD student television executive producer Meg Rossler. I'm going to ask Meg to ask the next question. Thank you, Ralph. So many young people in the United States often talk about skepticism in their futures compared to their parents or their grandparents. They see that owning a home in the future is unforeseeable. 
They see a planet that's been ravaged by climate change going largely unaddressed. And they see the Supreme Court stripping their personal rights from them about fa personal family planning and being handed to state governments. So what should Congress do to reassure young people of the reliability of our national institutions? Okay, according to the rules, Mr. Murphy, you speak first on this question. Well, that's a great question. And uh, I have many uh, young people involved in my campaign. And quite frankly, you know, I am running com for Congress, basically. My main motivation here is for my children and my grandchildren to pass on a world that is uh, as good as the one that I grew up in. And right now, it's not looking good for them. But to address your question, the accountability cr comes back into play here. Congress has to be accountable to the American people. And right now, Congress and this administration are not accountable to the American people. We see spending, out of control spending. And that will affect future generations. It will affect your children, your children's future, and our future as a nation. So now Congress has to be accountable on all levels to ensure a bright future for not only you, but for your family and your children. Congresswoman, uh, your response to a student's question about looking ahead to the future of the younger generation. Yeah, first of all, Meg, thank you so much for the question. You know, um, as I have gone up and down the state and talked to young people, there are issues that are really important to you, and climate being one of them was one of the reasons that I ran. And I think that what's important for us is to model what you want to see. For example, the fact that we've been able to pass legislation that has the largest investment in climate in the history of this country is something that I hope restores your faith. The fact that we've been able to deal with issues such as criminal justice reform and environmental justice, I hope that restores your faith. That really, part of it is us doing our part and then also including you in the decision making in being part of what we do. And I can say um, we have young people not only on our team, but also providing us with policy insights because that's really important. And then I think the other thing is to run, to get involved, to get engaged. Um, many of you have been the ones that have really pushed forward the major challenges and solutions of our time. And so I would just encourage you to continue to be a part of the solution. And, um, and, and again, I, I, feel, I feel hopeful because I look at you. You give me hope, and I'm, I'm just grateful for that. And we will continue to work with young people to make sure that we save this planet and that we save each other. I need to switch gears now. I know we could talk about the economy for the entire time of the debate, but there's a lot of other topics worth talking about as well. And I want to focus on another major national issue that we, we all know is on many voters' minds, the Supreme Court's decision after five decades to revoke the right of pregnant women to choose abortion. So for both of you, please, address this specific question. Should Congress pass legislation reversing the Supreme Court's decision codifying abortion rights into federal law or pass laws protecting women, physicians, providers who help women who are fleeing states that now ban abortion? Or should Congress stay out of the abortion issue altogether? Congresswoman Rochester, please first. Well, I am proud to say that I voted for, am a big supporter of the Women's Reproductive Health Act in Congress, which we passed in the House. Um, I believe, and I've said it on the floor of the House, I've said it here in Delaware, um, I believe there is no room in women's womb for politicians. Um, I, I just want to be clear about that. It feels like people are trying to roll back the freedoms that we've had, the autonomy that we've had. And um, I think that's a big difference between us. Um, I'm proud of what Delaware has been able to do, but what Republicans in Congress are proposing would actually nullify the will of the people here in Delaware. And we don't need to go backwards. I'm excited about moving forward and making sure that when we get back in the House and the Senate, that if we have the votes, we can codify Roe so that we can make sure that our bodies, our choices. Mr. Murphy, on abortion? 
Should Congress stay out of it? Should the states, should the Congress legislate on abortion? Well, really, this is not a political issue, number one. I agree with the decision, the Supreme Court decision, the constitutional decision to return the right, this important decision-making process back to the states. As people know here in Delaware, it's, it's a right. It's a protected right here in Delaware. And we, if someone wants to have an abortion here in Delaware, it's protected. And I believe that the decision-making power should be with the states. And if people want to change it one way or the other, they need to get involved. They need to talk to their legislatures. It's up to the states. It's up to the people in each state to make this important decision. Now, what's good for Delaware may not be good for another state in the United States. I think it's good. Personally, I am pro-life. I have always been pro-life. But a personal story. My daughter went through some tough times. She went through drug addiction. She came to rehab, and she got her life back out together. She was pregnant. Did I tell her that what to do or what not to do? No, she made her own choice. She made her own choice. And that choice was for life. And I applaud her for that decision. But did I tell her what to do? No, I did not. And the government, when it comes down to it, it's a woman's choice. Mr. Murphy, on, on the basis of what you just said about it being a state decision, if you're elected to Congress, then would you vote against the Republican House leader Kevin McCarthy's proposal, which he's already put before Congress, which would pass a federal law specifying abortion limits? Because you just said it, it should be a state decision. I think constitutionally, the Supreme Court was right. It is a state issue. It's where people can really have their voices heard, and each state can make their individual decisions on what's appropriate for their particular state. And you would vote that way in Congress if you were elected? Can you repeat that, please? Would you vote that way again if you were elected? Would you vote that way? And, and if, Mac I would if McCarthy's bill comes up, as he's already put it in Congress, you'd have to vote against it then, right? Yeah, I, I uphold the uh, Supreme Court's decision 100%. All yes. right, so, Congresswoman. So just to be clear, Right now, Lindsey Graham and McCarthy are suggesting a bill that would overturn the will of Delaware. And you are saying you would not support their proposal that, that would put limitations on, on women across this country. I mean, your daughter had a choice. She had a choice. That's what you She shared. made the right choice. That's what you But shared. it wasn't my choice. But it was, it was her choice. choice. Yes, she had a choice. Yes. And in the end, that's what it comes down to. So clarifying again, you would support Lindsey Graham and McCarthy or you wouldn't? I, as I stated, yeah, I support you, you, the Supreme Court decision. Okay. Handing it back to the states where it rightfully belongs, where people can get in touch with their legislators and do what's best for the interests of that particular state. That's where it belongs. It's protected in Delaware. The fear mongering that Republicans will ban all abortions every, the, the fear mongering really gets to me. It upsets people. I have, I've had people call me that, that, that this, it, I'll just end it there. Yeah, I, well, this question has been asked and answered. So, but I, I have a related question that will, that both of you can respond to as well. And that is prompted by, uh, my reading of a piece by Mr. Murphy in the First State Times in which he wrote that Roe v. Wade is not settled law, that the concept of settled law is a made-up concept. And I want to ask each of you, how do you feel about the concept of settled law? Do you apply it to other court pre precedents, including cases protecting gay rights and interracial marriage, so they also would not be settled law, or, or are settled law, depending on your point of view, and should be reconsidered or even reversed. So question is, how do you feel about the issue of settled law on abortion, and would you apply it to other issues as well? Mr. Murphy? The abortion issue is separate, and there's, I have complete faith in the Supreme Court in their decision-making process. And I believe everybody should have faith in the Supreme Court. Uh, in terms of other issues, uh, I would very much have to look at those issues and make a determination on uh, whatever Supreme Court decision came down, whether I agree with it or not agree with it.
Congresswoman? You know, I think that what really concerns people, and young people as well, is that we believed that it was settled. Roe versus Wade was settled. Then when you get a justice like Clarence Thomas, who basically says other things are on the table, like contraception, like gay marriage, marriage equality, that doesn't instill confidence, unfortunately. I believe that these things, you know, my ability to even be on this stage as a black woman who ran for Congress, who even had the right to vote, these things, we don't want to go backwards. We want to go forwards. And so, um, to me, when people start talking about contraception, when they start talking about marriage equality, it's a slippery slope when you go after something that is o almost 50 years old that has been the law of the land. Um, to me, that, 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 that is unsettling for people. And that's why so many people are coming out and voting because they don't want to go backwards. They don't want their rights to be taken away. And that's one of the reasons why this moment is important. Staying for, with the concept of federal guarantees of civil rights for a few moments, and uh, I just want to point out the Center for Political Communication at UD just came out with a new uh, public opinion survey here in Delaware that showed that 80% of Delawareans support laws protecting transgender students from discrimination in schools. So I want to ask you about a very particular aspect of that policy area, so please bear with me on this question. Should the federal government pass a law guaranteeing individuals, regardless of their age, a right to seek and receive medical treatment for gender transition? Should medical treatment in transgender cases, like medical treatment in abortion-related cases, as the Supreme Court has now ruled, be decided by the states, by the federal government, by doctors, by the courts, or by individuals and their families? In other words, should states have the power to allow or ban medical treatment for people who are gender transitioning? Congresswoman? You know, again, this is a moment where people are feeling excluded. Um, it's challenging enough going through what these young people are going through. And I think it's very clear that there are medical <coughs> aspects of this, um, that there are um, aspects of this that relate to um, that young person and their families. And this is not something that I've seen come up in Congress, um, but we have been very upfront and supportive of protections for transgender children. Um, that's something that's important to me. Part of it is that I think a lot of times people, people want to be seen. They want to be heard. They want to be respected. It's not a, it's, it, that's, what, that's what this is really about, is young people being able to be fully who they are. So um, I think this is uh, one of those issues that should it come before Congress, uh, I, I would definitely do my due diligence but I would definitely support those young people that really um, need to be, be able to be able to live their full free self. Mr. Murphy? Yes, I mean, this issue is very near and dear to me. Uh, having been a teacher and a coach for many years, I have coached boys and girls all ages, uh, and I, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And I think what we're talking about here, as a coach, as a teacher, uh, we are compassionate. Uh, we are compassionate people and we deal with every child uh, individually. And regardless of, of who they are or, or what they're going through or, or how, they're, how they're perceived in the world. And, and compassion is the big word here. And we care about everybody. We care about all children. But I just want to address the fact that I can't even really believe that I'm talking about parents having rights here in our schools and what's decided uh, in our schools and then outside of our schools. Uh, parents should have the right uh, to determine, uh, you know, on these important issues regarding sexuality, it should be between the parent and the, the school and the child and whatever other professional that they need to talk with. So the state, this is very personal and it's a very it's not a 
political issue and it should not be treated as an issue to the, which I think divides people rather than bringing people together. And so you would make a distinction. What, what is the distinction that you apparently make between the transgender policy issue and let's say the abortion issue, which you've already said here tonight, should be decided by the Supreme Court and then by the states? Yeah, I, I just feel that we, instead of dividing, this is very, divide. Look, everybody is protected under the laws of this country. We don't need to, to really, we, we need to not continue to, 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 to set this group over here and this group over here and this group has uh, special needs and this group, we, we need to come together. Everybody, and again, going back to the word, it's it, compassion and, and treat individuals as individuals address their needs, and for God's sakes, parents need to have a say in, in, in their child's life, period. Con right. Congresswoman, you said a, a moment ago this issue hadn't come up before Congress yet. But I, want, I just want to, I, I want to say something, though, about, I'm really glad to hear you talk about compassion. Um, I know two young people in this state that have, have come to me with their parents and talked about the challenges that they face every single day. And, you know, in this country right now, you, you, as you said, um, I do feel these things are being politicized. I do feel that um, for those young people, life is challenging enough. It is hard enough without having being demonized. And so, um, you know, I wish we all would talk about compassion, but also recognize that just because we say we all have rights doesn't mean that it really plays out that way in people's everyday lives. I um, want to uh, turn our attention in this next segment to some questions about the state of democracy in the United States. National public opinion polls show that many Americans, both Republicans and Democrats, say they are concerned about threats to American democracy. I want to ask each of you if you think state or federal legislators in the United States have the power to overturn, reverse, or otherwise change the decision of the voters in national elections after the voters have cast their ballots. Do national legislators have the ability, the power, to change the outcome of an election after the voters have cast their ballots? Mr. Murphy? No, our, our elections are spelled out in the Constitution. And there are certain procedures to ensure the integrity and the, the, the fairness of all our elections. Uh, when the voters speak, the voters speak. And uh, that their will uh, should not be overturned. Congresswoman? What is surprising to me, again in this moment, um, having been trapped up in the Capitol on the day of January 6th, is to see that, I read an article recently that there are 299 election deniers running for office at this moment. That means people who didn't believe in the results of the last presidential election. It was clear. There were court cases, there were all of these different things. And I do believe, again, one of the reasons why young people are concerned is because our democracy is also at stake, fragile and at the same time resilient. Thank God we came back that night and did our job and actually really upheld that peaceful transfer of power. But no, should, should people be able to just overturn the will of the people? No. And the people spoke. Joe Biden is the duly elected president of this country. And some people just don't, don't believe it. Uh, you both have sort of moved in the direction of my next question, so I'd like to kind of go continue on this topic for a minute. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Murphy, how would you characterize, Congresswoman Blunt Rochester just characterized the January 6th events, and so I want to give you an opportunity to do that as well. How would you characterize what happened on January 6th, 2021? Of course, you know the National Republican Party, your party, has officially described it as legitimate political discourse. How do you characterize well, it? Well, first of all, uh, I just want to touch on 2020's election. Uh, there were a lot of concerns over the integrity and transparency uh, of that election. 
And that's really a nonpartisan issue in my travels here. People want fair elections, regardless if you're a Democrat or independent or a Republican. So going forward, voter integrity is very important and transparency is very important. Was 2020 rigged? I ran in 2020. Uh, as I said, there were many concerns uh, and the transparency of that election. Uh, there were many inconsistencies and um, uh, we need not to let that happen. Many voters are really upset and turned off. Uh, they think their vote does not count. We have to restore that faith in our system that every vote counts in this election upcoming. So uh, so just to be clear, you're, you're not saying it was rigged or not rigged. You're just not weighing in on that issue. Yeah, I, I am inconsistencies, lack of transparency. And, and your question. Your question was about January, 20, January 6th. Was it legitimate political discourse? January 6th, it, we have, uh, I will uphold the Constitution of the United States when I am sworn in as your next congressman. The First Amendment is guarantees freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. And the vast majority of people that day demonstrated and voiced their opinion. However, there were people that broke the law that day that should be punished and held accountable for their misdeeds on that particular day. Just as everyone that, uh, uh, that breaks the law in this country, destroys properties, destroys businesses, uh, everybody that breaks the law in this country should be held accountable. And, but with the First Amendment guarantees assembly and freedom of speech. Congresswoman, you already mentioned your presence at the Capitol. How would you characterize what happened on January 6th? Well, first, I want to be clear that it has been said and documented, even by Trump officials, that that was one of the most uh, safe, fair elections with that. I don't even know where we're getting all this stuff about there's bipartisan agreement that there were inconsistencies, because there wasn't. People voted, and they made their voices heard. On that day, I will tell you, I, sometimes I think back to the fact that if somebody came into your house, broke in your house or your job, they broke in, they stole things, they defecated, they, uh, they then wanted to kill you. I would not call that a walk in the park or a trip or whatever it was being characterized as. Um, that day was to me the hardest day and my greatest day in Congress. It was the hardest day, not because you know, of what was happening in that moment, but what I saw afterwards in terms of people scaling the Capitol, walking through with a Confederate flag, all of that. And then it was a great day because we came back that morning and we made sure that we certified that election. That showed both the fragility of this moment, but also our resilience as a country. And that's another thing that I hope young people pay attention to, that we came back and that this is about rule of law, and that this is about peaceful transfer of power, and that this is about our American way of life. If we believe these things, then we have to baseline acknowledge who the president of the United States is and say it with authority. All right. Since you mentioned, again, young people, I'd like to turn to Meg Rossler again for the next question that's going to be thematically on the same area. Go ahead, Meg. Thank you, Ralph. So there's a lot of negative conversation regarding our nation's democracy on platforms like TikTok and Twitter. So do you believe that the checks and balances system established by the Founding Fathers is still working today? Okay, checks and balances. Mr. Murphy, you're first on this one. Meg, that's a great question. And uh, in the last four years or six years, we've seen a uh, really a lack of faith and a breakdown in our institutions. Uh, where we had checks and balances uh, before. Uh, we've seen a Department of Justice basically uh, go off the rails and uh, pretty much uh, hunt down a president based on no knowledge or no facts or no evidence at all. Using uh, government institutions to go after uh, individuals, whether they be in the government or outside of the government, uh, is wrong. It's just plain wrong. So once again, we have to have faith in our institutions. 
I think the approval rating of Congress is like 17 percent. Uh, the approval rating of the president is at an all-time low at 39 uh, percent. All our institutions uh, are, are at risk right now. And the founders that, of our great country put those checks and balances in place so no one, one arm of the government could get out of control and rule this world and destroy our republic. Congresswoman Blunt Rochester, is, are the checks and balances institutions working? Well, first of all, Meg, to the beginning of your question, where you even talked about those platforms, I think one of the biggest challenges that we've had, and really um, to, you know, follow up, you talked about a president who um, actually took classified documents home and thinks it's okay to have them there, uh, really created or allowed for this environment where people don't, not only do they not trust the media, they don't trust each other. And so for me, even as we went through the beginning of this pandemic, there were three themes. It was recover, rebuild, and restore. We have to recover from this pandemic. And so to say that Joe Biden is the reason why we have supply chain problems is, is not true. But we have to recover economically and physically. We gotta rebuild, and that's what we've done with the bipartisan infrastructure bill. And then we have to restore. And that's part of what this whole moment is about, finding those things, sharing with people the things that we've been able to do as Democrats and Republicans on gun safety, on making sure that veterans with the PAC Act are taken care of. There are things that we can do to restore people's faith. But the biggest check is the people. You need to be able to participate. You need to be able to have the right to vote. And we don't need individuals that are trying to take away your rights. We need folks that are going to make sure that you continue to have that right to be the biggest check on all of us. I'd like to turn now to some questions on public safety and gun policy issues. They've already come up. This debate is being held at the University of Delaware, which is a highly ranked research institution. But researchers here at UD and at many other uh, similar places are prevented from gathering information from the real world about gun violence in the United States, including recent gun violence just in Wilmington, Delaware, for example, because Congress doesn't approve federal funding for such research. So I'm asking both of you, should Congress approve funding for national research on the causes and potential cures of gun violence in the United States to help frame gun laws to be passed by Congress. Congresswoman, you're first on this one. You know, I want to thank, again, many groups out there like Moms Demand Action in every town and others that push this issue of gun violence to the fore. Um, this really, you know, a lot of times we hear about the mass shootings, but it's those everyday shootings in our communities and in our neighborhoods that are also impacted. And so I'm proud to say that I was supportive of making sure that we could study gun violence, but I also am proud to say that I uh, was actually one of the supporters and a voter of the Safer Communities Act, which is actually a bipartisan piece of legislation, first of its kind in 30 years, and really it was because it was pushed by young folks to make sure that we lived up to common sense gun safety legislation. I also was involved in, or actually co-lead in a bill called Break the Cycle of Violence, based on things that I learned right here in Delaware, things that work, like group violence intervention and hospital-based interventions to stop retaliation. This, to me, in addition to making sure that we got funding that comes to local communities to solve local community problems has been what I've been working on and what I want to continue to work on because we still have so much more to do. Um, I, again, applaud being able to collect the data, but it's also important what we do on the ground with that data. And so I'm, I'm glad that we've been able to pass this legislation, this first in 30 years, but there's still more to be done. Mr. Murphy, your view on um, doing national research on gun violence to help shape future legislation? Well, we, we do have a problem with uh, violence in this country. And for the uh, Congresswomen and the Democratic Party to put it on law-abiding uh, citizens that legally, uh, lawfully own guns, I think is terribly wrong. Uh, I am a strong supporter of our Constitution, and I'm a strong supporter of our Second Amendment. When we look at violence in this country, there's many root causes. 
and one could be classified as the economy, where we have an economy that is not working, we have poverty. And what happens? Impoverished neighborhoods, violence happens. People turn to other means of supporting themselves. And that many times includes violence. The drug trade in our country is out of control. With the root causes of violence are not at the hands of legally owning gun owners that support our country. It's more, it's deeper, it's more involved. We have to get to the root causes of our violence in this country. What causes it? Okay, I want to follow up on public public safety uh, issue. Uh, there have been clashes, as we all know from reading the news over the last couple of years, and across the political spectrum. Local and state police departments have made a variety of different decisions about officers wearing and using body cameras. I'd like to ask you both whether you favor expansion of body camera use by community police forces, and for that matter, maybe other forms of surveillance, such as cameras on utility poles or even in drones as are used in other countries. Do you support surveillance of U.S. citizens using facial recognition, for example, as China does extensively? Mr. Murphy, first. Uh, no, I don't support uh, uh, facial uh, recognition as China, uh, not in this country. And overall, uh, there's surveillance and then there's surveillance that violates our rights, our privacy rights under the Constitution. And we're talking, we're talking about policing here in, in our country. And I, I am proud to have the endorsement of the Delaware Fraternal Order of Police for the second time. But let's, let's look at what's happening here in our public safety. Police officers are, are leaving in droves in, in our country. And what, does that, what happens there? Our most vulnerable neighborhoods are at risk. I campaign all over, up and down the state, in all kinds of neighborhoods. And the most vulnerable people in our cities, in our states, in the state, are really left at risk. Again, the police should be supported. The police are not the problem. They need our backing. We have a breakdown in law and order in our society right now. It cannot continue. If we're going to have a civil society where people can walk down the street and be safe and feel comfortable, we have to get back where criminals are prosecuted, victims are protected, and people that commit crimes face penalties. Right now, they face nothing. Congresswoman, the question of expansion or continued use of body cameras and other kinds of surveillance like facial recognition. So I have to say, um, you know, body-worn cameras is something that I've had the opportunity to work on as our congressperson. You know, and that was based on, again, how I work. I bring people together. We brought people from the community. We brought advocates. We brought law enforcement to the table and said, what are some of the things that we all agree on? One was that body-worn cameras are both a positive for police because they actually have proof if they need it, but it's also an accountability piece. And so one of the things that I did was bring them around the table and actually put, they put in an application to make sure that Delaware could be one of the first states, if not the first state, where all law enforcement who were eligible had body-worn cameras. Again, the goal here was to make sure that there was accountability, but at the same time, I also want to touch on the support for police, because in Congress, what we've seen, I just voted on legislation to provide training and funding to help these, particularly our smaller police stations. Um, I get an opportunity, I've had an opportunity to talk to law enforcement up and down the state, and those are the kinds of supports that they need. However, Republicans in Congress voted against it. They voted against supporting our Capitol Police, the ones who fought for us during the insurrection. So let's put our, 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 our real, let's not just talk about this, let's do the work. Let's bring people together to try to make sure that we have safer communities. Yeah. How about facial recognition? Uh, Mr. Murphy answered that. Uh, do you favor use of that in yeah, the U.S.? Yeah, we have not had any conversation about that with law enforcement. But what I can say is one of the challenges <coughs> with facial recognition that we've seen is that, and this gets to some of the times the issues of making sure who's the ones developing the technology. We had an example of a, a person who went through an airport, black man, who was stopped, detained, arrested, 
and they found out that the facial recognition didn't work. This guy turned out to be a judge. And so, again, that, that's one we haven't had any time to, like, really talk to law enforcement about or talk to our folks in our civil liberties community. Um, but it, you know, but this, this is, you know, to me, we, we like to have the conversations. We bring people together. You want to have a brief additional yeah. comment? Brief. Congresswoman, you haven't really supported the police. You haven't been out front. You haven't raised your voice to support the police. And I just want to ask the audience. I'm, I'm going to ask okay. that we adhere to the rule, which is we're not okay. attacking each okay. other in this debate. We're talking about our own qualifications and our own okay. positions on these issues. Okay. I appreciate you, that, Ralph. You can continue if you want to. But well, I, I, I just want to ask the audience out there, who today, who today in the audience would want to be a policeman? Why, why would you step forward? This is an honorable profession, one of the most revered in our history, in our country. But who today would, would want to be a policeman where you're not going to be backed, where you're going to have laws passed in Congress that really cut your legs off and, and, and don't give you the ability to enforce the law? Okay, I want to change topics again. Again, we could talk about any one of these things for a long time. This is an important I, I issue, do have too, though. To, I have to say something. You, you were attacked, you, so exactly. respond. I think it's wrong, disingenuous, for you to say I have not been supportive of the police. Maybe that, that's your opinion, but for me, I'm trying to support everyone. We had a saying when I ran that when Lisa goes to Washington, we all go to Washington. And that's what I strive to do every single day, hear the voices up and down this state. Again, if Republicans in Congress mean it, then they need to put their vote where their mouth is and vote to support law enforcement. Okay, I wanna turn to uh, housing issues, the nation's housing problem. And it's a problem not just around the nation, it's a problem in virtually every state, including in Delaware. Some people even call it a housing crisis when they think about homeless people or young people trying to buy their first home, for example. So the question I want to ask you is, home builders in the United States have very few incentives to build what you and I would call affordable homes high land prices, not in my backyard politics, wealthy home buyers in desirable areas, and even local governments who are thirsting for real estate tax revenue all drive builders in the direction of building large, expensive homes. Should Congress do anything about this to improve the supply of affordable and smarter and affordable starter homes in desirable areas in this country? Congresswoman first on this one. Yeah, I mean, housing to me is one of the, the number one issues that a lot of times you don't hear on the TV, but it's something I hear up and down this state. I went and visited a business and one of the owners uh, asked his COO to come in, the chief operating officer, she, she was 51 years old. And he said, tell the Congresswoman where you live. And she said, with my parents. This is one of the issues that I have tried to be very upfront with, number one, I introduced the housing and affordability uh, supply bill in Congress to really break down the barriers and help municipalities as well as communities come together to figure out the, the plans to be able to build that affordable housing that we're talking about. I've been able to bring dollars to Delaware for both homelessness as well as housing, as well as organizations such as Habitat for Humanity. This uh, is one of those things where, you know, it's many times building generational wealth for a family. Uh, it's sometimes, I remember for my family coming to Delaware, our first home as kids, it deals with our education system. It, it cuts so many different ways. And so for us, this is a priority and we will continue to make it a priority. <coughs> that bill, the housing affordability bill, had over 100 organizations across the country support it, including Up for Growth. This is a bill that we need to pass and we need to make sure that we have more affordable housing stock in Delaware and I will continue to work on that. Mr. Murphy, your view on affordable, should Congress uh, do something to increase the amount of affordable housing, not just for the homeless problem, but also for the problem of the young people trying to start out? Well, a absolutely Congress should do something. And, and this goes back to the runaway inflation we have right now. We have a uh, administration that, uh, where the Fed is raising interest rates by the day, by the week. Uh, mortgages are at an all-time high, 7%, over 7%. We have to get back to a vibrant economy. The answer is not for the Fed to raise interest rates, and in that in raises mortgage rates. It raises 
people need to, to have a healthy economy. In a healthy economy, the Fed does not have to artificially raise their rates. We just witnessed two years ago where you could get a mortgage for one, two, or three percent. We need to get back to where people can afford houses and continue to talk about the economy where people are working in jobs created by a healthy economy that will in turn allow them, just as it did when I first bought my first, first house, to be able to afford a house. And we've seen in these inflationary times, you know, mortgage rates are going up, rents are going up, everything is going up. So this is an economic issue. Rather than the, con the Congress or the, the government subsidizing, let's get back to a healthy economy, get our economy going so people can work and buy a house. Mr. Murphy, uh, interest rates have been at a very, very low level on mortgages for a very long time many years, not just in the last couple of years, the high mortgage rates certainly are high now, but only in recent months. I'm asking you about fundamental policy, national policy on affordable housing, not about something that's just happened in the last few months. I think, I think locally here in, in uh, Sussex County, uh, I'll, I'll just use a, uh, an example that uh, the local government in Sussex County is, is looking into and in making affordable housing for the people that actually work in that area. Uh, as you know, uh, Sussex County is a, a vacation, many vacation homes. Uh, they need uh, workers. Uh, the workers have to travel great distances to get there. The local governments, and I think this is a local issue too, are, are, are working to provide and make available housing that is affordable to people that are not uh, uh, in the upper income levels of our society. Okay, we've gotten to the point in our debate where it's time for what we call the lightning round uh, of questions. It's a few questions which lend themselves to shorter answers. Uh, so I'm gonna ask you each to, to answer these questions, the following questions, in a minute or less. Uh, and the first one is gonna be asked by Meg Rossler, the uh, executive uh, <coughs> producer of Student Television Network here at UD. Meg? Thanks, thanks again, Ralph. So President Biden has taken some administrative steps to reduce student debt, and the application for debt relief is open through the end of 2023, but for future generations of college students. Is debt relief something you believe should become permanent? All right, uh, uh, Mr. Murphy, you're first on this question. Permanent relief for student debt? Per permanent relief for student debt? I don't believe in permanent relief for any debts uh, in our United States of America. Uh, well, let's just talk about uh, this student loan forgiveness. Uh, I paid back my student loans. My, my children paid back uh, their student loans. Um, and I, I knew many people uh, that I graduated from high school that, that could not afford to go to college who are still working. And my problem with uh, the president's action other than being unconstitutional, it should have been passed in Congress, and Congress should have stood up and said, no, this is our job to vote on this, not you, Mr. President. But why should people that couldn't afford to go to college, hardworking Americans are now forced to pay this billions and billions of dollars of debt that other people incurred? It's just wrong. Congresswoman, student debt, it's temporary right now, should it be permanent? Well, first of all, I wanna say that you know, we got to remember, just last year, we weren't even able to be here in person. We were in a pandemic. These times are different than before. And so as we look at what folks are going through right now, if this provides relief to those families and then also gives them dollars that they can go out and be able to put back into the economy, that's a good thing. These are people, some of whom have had these debts for years and years and years. For me, one of the things that I think we need to be looking at is college affordability. We should be talking about why does college cost so much? And then the second thing is not everybody needs a four-year degree. So I've put forth legislation called the Jobs Act, and it's to allow for Pell Grants for short-term training and opportunities to be able to deal with some of the workforce issues that I've heard from employers throughout this state. So um, to me, I think this was a good thing. I think this was a timely thing. I think it was a necessary thing to help hurting families. Speaking of the pandemic, uh, next lightning round question. The pandemic by now has produced a lot of data. We, we've collected all the information now over three years uh, showing who was infected and who got in vaccines and, uh, and so on, who died, of course. Um, 
The data, among other things, shows that black and brown populations suffered significantly more infections and more deaths uh, in, around the country. And interestingly to me anyway, it shows that Republicans have suffered more infections and more deaths than Democrats. The data also show our public health system struggled to respond to the pandemic. What legislation would you support in Congress to improve the future strength of public health systems at the state level uh, around the country? Congresswoman, you're first on this one. Well, first of all, I'm proud that I was able to be <coughs> a part of passing the American Rescue Plan, the CARES Act. Those bills, many, some of those bills that started us in the very beginning of this pandemic were bipartisan because we recognized the situation that we were in. I'm also proud that I was able to be able to get provisions in that dealt with collecting that data and make sure that we got the data because before many of us didn't even know because of our public health infrastructure. I actually had the opportunity to serve as Deputy Secretary of Health and Social Services here in Delaware and I'm also on the health subcommittee. And so we've been working very diligently to be able to bolster with legislation and investments to bolster our public health infrastructure because you're right, what this pandemic showed were the holes and the, um, the lack of where we had those holes in our system. And it gives us an opportunity to strengthen them moving forward. Mr. Murphy, strengthening public health in the United States? Well, stre strengthening public health is always an important issue uh, in our country. Uh, and we learned a lot uh, during the uh, uh, pandemic, for sure. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, our country uh, moves forward and uh, uh, we've learned some hard lessons. But public health, I think number one is, is education. And what people don't talk about in this country uh, are, are healthy lifestyles. People that uh, prevention, uh, it seems like we are a reactionary uh, many times in terms of, uh, of, of diseases and other sicknesses. Uh, we really need to head it off, prevent, and deal with that. And ed education, education, education when it comes to pu public health. All right. Um, I, I, I'm going to apologize. I intended to ask a follow-up question on the housing thing. It's my fault I got it out of order, so I'm going to come back to that topic. But it's related in a way that I think you'll, you'll be able to follow the train of thought. I apologize for my, uh, my error. Uh, and this one is connected to climate change. Do you think Congress should require states to begin moving people and businesses away from environmentally threatened areas in the United States, such as the coasts here in Delaware and other uh, parts of the United States, and the western U.S. facing wildfires and drought? How would you deal with the issue of rebuilding and, re and moving people into areas that are environmentally threatened? Mr. Murphy? Uh, no, I, I think we live in a country and I think people can make their own personal decisions on what, where they want to live. Uh, I happen to live in New Orleans in, uh, uh, before and during and after Katrina. And I have to say that uh, not only is it a great city, but uh, New Orleans has always been in a position where they have uh, been vulnerable to national disasters. And uh, after uh, Katrina, many people wrote uh, New, Orleans, New Orleans off, and, uh, and it's back and as strong as ever, and people want to live there for a reason, uh, because it's a good place and it's their home. So no, I don't think the government has that right to, to do that. Okay, I got to follow up though, because you said people have a right to live wherever they want to live, and I certainly wouldn't dispute that, but are you saying that they have a right to live there, and then when their house gets washed out by the sea or burned down by a wildfire or something like that, the federal government has a responsibility to subsidize flood insurance and other kinds of insurance to rebuild their house in the same threatened area? Is that what you're saying? They have a right to live there? Well, first, I don't think, uh, you know, if people want to live there and incur the cost of that insurance, and it should be incurred by them. That's strictly up But it's up federally there. subsidized flood insurance. They're not paying the full premium on that insurance. Well, then they should be, we should take a hard look at where those tax dollars are going to support that and make strong recommendations that people maybe should move uh, to another location. Okay, Congresswoman, how about you on the question of uh, is it time to be looking at moving people away from threatened air, environmentally threatened areas? You know, it's interesting because for, for us as a state, I mean, we're the lowest mean elevation in the country. And so I say to my colleagues that we're urban, suburban, rural, and coastal. When I talk to our farmers, the 
climate has an impact on what they do. When I talk to our folks from environmental justice communities, they talk about the fact that when it rains, it floods there. And so just yesterday, um, I got to participate in a, uh, an event that was the grand opening of the South Bridge Wetland Park. And it was incredible because it was an opportunity to do the science of making sure that we're resilient and that we have the right plants and things that we'll be able to, but also dealing with wastewater and making sure that we have healthy communities. And there was a boardwalk and it was a really a combination of state, federal, local, but led by community. And so to me, this presents an opportunity for us. That's why the Inflation Reduction Act, that investment, in addition to what I'm doing with Senator Carper, called the Shore Act, will deal with some of the, the mitigating some of those challenges so that we don't have to deal with people being displaced. Uh, that, so, so for me, um, it's really about making sure that we save this planet and that we make sure that we have a good quality of life for everyone. So I got to follow up with you just and as on I... Flood and on flood insurance, okay. um, I can actually say that um, for, for me, it has been watching, because I'm not on the committee of jurisdiction that does this, um, but there has been a lot of debate about how much to subsidize and whether to subsidize. Uh, I believe that there are families in our state that, you know, are living in areas that you know, they do deserve to have that flood insurance. And so um, one of the things that I also worked on was to make sure that the maps, even the coastal maps were correct to allow those who were eligible to be able to get it. So, um, you know, uh, similar to, to Mr. Murphy, we might actually agree on something in terms of making sure that we look at what's the right mix. Um, but this has been an issue that has challenged Congress um, for, I would probably say, this whole, whole session. So a very short uh, follow-up to both of you on this question, because you've both talked about this. Uh, you both talked about the fact that people need to live where they like to live and so on. Uh, Congresswoman, you frequently tout the money the federal government sends to Delaware and other states as well to rebuild beaches after they're swamped in a storm. Is that the right federal policy? But think about it. Our beaches aren't just those homes. Our beaches are economic development. Our beaches are our natural habitats. Our beaches are a part of who we are as Delaware. So, yeah, I'm proud of that work to be able to restore our beaches. I think that's important to our state. Do you want to comment on that one, Mr. Murphy? Restoration of beach, beaches using federal funds, would you vote for that? Well, if we have to restore Delaware beaches, we have to restore beaches everywhere. Well, and, and let's that, do that. Yeah. And uh, I, I love our beaches in Delaware, and uh, uh, and I, I I want them in uh, pristine shape. <laughs> All right. A final lightning round question, if I may. If you are elected to Congress, will you support continuing or shutting down the House investigation of responsibility for the January sixth attack on Congress? It's a short answer question. Do you support continuing or shutting down the House investigation? And what about the Justice Department's investigation? Continue or shut it down? Congresswoman, you're first on this one. I think you go until you get justice. I think there's, uh, as I said before, there were people who broke the law. Um, there was mis... Uh, I mean, this is the fundamental part of our, 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 our country. And when the hearings first began, I can tell you that those of us who were trapped up in the gallery talked about the feeling of finally understanding what happened, finally understanding what, uh, who did what. And now we get to figure out how do we avoid that from ever happening again. So we finish it when the job is done. Mr. Murphy, what about shutting down or continuing the House investigation and the Justice investigation? Yes, when, we, uh, uh, when the next Congress uh, convenes, uh, we will have... Uh, instead of this partisan investigation, we will have a nonpartisan investigation. And we do need to get to the root uh, causes and reasons of why January 6th happened. But with the current investigation, uh, it's very partisan, one sided. We need to have a nonpartisan. Uh, the American people deserve to know the truth about what happened on January 6th. All right. Well, I'm afraid that concludes our time available for the Q&A. So I'm going to give both of you a chance to offer voters your the concluding thoughts for this debate. 
Uh, and I'd like to ask you to please keep your concluding thoughts to about one minute in length. We'll start with Congresswoman Blunt Rochester. This was part of the coin toss decision before the debate for a closing statement, please. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, University of Delaware. And thank you to all of you who tuned in. I think tonight is really for me about those three themes that I talked about. Our ability as a country to recover, rebuild, and restore our faith in our institutions and in each other. In addition to that, I think this election is also about two things. Making sure that we don't go backwards in our rights, particularly a woman's right to choose, and making sure also that our democracy stands intact. I want to thank you for the opportunity to serve you, especially during this time. And I want to tell you, I renewed my confidence, I renewed my strength, I renewed my commitment to our democracy on January 6th. And now I want to continue to serve you because there's so much more to be done. I also want to thank you so much for your support and for your prayers. And I hope that I have your, elect, your vote on Election Day, November 8th. Thank you so much, Delaware, for being there. And now to Lee Murphy for your closing statement, please. Also, about one minute, please. Thank you, Ralph, for hosting this event. You'd think my opponent was the challenger. Uh, she has lots of ideas, and she's also had years to act, but she hasn't. She could have spoken up as recession reared its ugly head. She didn't. She could have voted against trillions in inflationary spending. She could have spoken out about the bad foreign policy that got 13 U.S. Marines killed in Afghanistan. She could have used her soapbox to stand up to a president just one time. She didn't. She went along with all of it. In fact, she voted with Nancy Pelosi 100% of the time. Pelosi does not have Delaware's best interests at heart. If you want someone that does, who will help your family build a better life right here in Delaware with lower crime, and better schools, vote for me. I'll vote for policies that help small businesses create jobs. I'll vote to make America energy independent. I'll fight inflation by working to balance the federal checkbook just like you have to balance yours. These are the stakes in this election, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate your vote on November 8th. Let's get to work, and thank you. Because both of the candidates agreed not to attack in their closing statements, um, I'm going to have to give Congresswoman uh, Blunt Rochester an opportunity to respond to Mr. Murphy's attack. Thank you, Ralph. Listen, Delaware, I'm not going to respond to those things because those are not the things that I hear from you when I'm talking to you up and down the state. My dad always said to me, Lisa, when you run for something, run for the people. Don't run against someone. I'm going to continue to be who I am. I'm going to continue to serve you by bringing people together. I'm going to continue to uplift. I'm going to continue to hear your voice and take it to Washington, D.C. And again, if that's what you want in a leader, then I'm your person. I want to serve you. You have been there for my family, for me, and I have been there for you, and I've got your back. And so we just hope that you will show up in strong numbers on November 8th and make sure that we take this country in the right direction, a positive direction, an uplifting direction for our water, our health, our planet, and for our democracy. Congresswoman Blunt Rochester and Mr. Murphy, thank you both very much for participating in Delaware Debates 2022. On behalf of Delaware Public Media and the University of Delaware Center for Political Communication, thank all of you for watching Delaware Debates. I'm Ralph Begleiter, encouraging all of you to cast your vote by Tuesday, November 8th. Thank you.